with, we want to really, really recap one of the most entertaining games in a long time, which is United v Brentford. A very strange evening, a mixture of emotions going on for most fans. I think if you're somebody who's had enough of Eric, Eric Ten Hag, who thinks he m needs to be sacked ASAP, even though you probably still believe the Glazers are the biggest problem, which they are, you're frustrated with our style of play, you hate the players, you're probably in a little bit of a weird situation because you were kind of hoping Brentford would be us. <laughs> so it put more pressure on Eric Ten Hag heading into the, the international break so that then he might be able to get sacked, which is not going to happen anytime soon. I think any fan out there who is secretly hoping Eric Ten Hag gets sacked, you're going to be waiting a long, long time. Even though the Glazers have a track record of sacking managers who don't get into the top four, because Champions League football and that place and playing Champions League football, not trying to win the trophy, is the thing that they care about the most. So if you're a fan, I understand. But unfortunately, the Glazers still take a very long time to sack managers. It really is right until the end point that they do it. And considering how ill-prepared they've been over the years in terms of hiring managers who's on their shortlist and stuff, I don't have any faith that the owners have any idea who they're going to higher next i think if i'm the owners most likely these glazers these vermins who are sucking the club dry they're obviously doing it in order to kind of try to get a higher you know bid than they've already got there's rumors out there that the qatari group have bid up to like six billion um obviously um sir jim ratcliffe has come out and he wants partial ownership for a significant amount also maybe in a two billion mark but they probably are looking for around 8 to 10, I'd assume. That's what they're holding out for. So if they're holding out for 8 to 10, you know, they're going to hold out for it. They're not going to do any more extra investment into the club, especially when it comes to hiring managers, if they if they don't need to. So in their ideal world, they'd much rather hold on to Eric Ten Hag, do the sale, get that over the line, get the funds transferred, and then the new owners can do what they want with the manager. But I don't think they're, they're in any rush to try and replace him because it would just add more headache and work. Um, and we already know they're kind of, you know, they're headache and work shy. So they don't want to get involved in that regard. So Eric Ten Hag would have to go on a really crazy odd run um, and the club has got too many good players for that to happen for him to be at any risk of getting sacked so I think if you're a fan if you're not a fan of his just strap in and enjoy the ride unfortunately for the game itself very strange one I have to be honest um, I thought Brentford were very 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 unlucky to come away with absolutely nothing from the game I think maybe they got a little bit too excited towards the end. I saw a couple of their defenders punching the air, getting really hyped um, because they were clearing balls and it was only like the 80th or 70th minute or something. They were probably looking um, at the clock way too much. They probably should have just focus on trying to defend or scoring another goal. I was thinking, even though we weren't playing well, we didn't really have many clear cut chances. We didn't really disturb. We didn't really disturb their goalkeeper. We didn't really, you know, stretch their defense. I did have a feeling that that one goal wouldn't be enough. I had a feeling that we would maybe, you know, sneakily jam, you know, jammy wise, um, nick a draw. But I didn't think 1-0 for Brentford away from home would be enough to really seal the victory personally. But they did really keep us occupied. Um, what's his name? The strikers they have up front. Was it um, Wissa and Mbwemo? did a really good job in terms of disturbing our our centre-backs, even though I think Johnny Evans had a really good game for us, um, um, unfortunately enough. Um, he played really well. He led the line well. I thought Maguire was fairly decent too. Um, he actually had the assist that led to the winning goal. But Wissen and Buemo did really well, but I guess they didn't have the cutting edge up front, which is probably what they're missing with um, Ivan Tony being out suspended for that, you know, gambling infraction that he's got punished for. But overall, I thought they played very well. I think we controlled maybe the first 10 or so minutes. Um, then Brentford started to assert more control. And then their goal came just as they were starting to get a little bit more um, possession and little combinations uh, forward in their kind of play. And I think the goal, if I'm not mistaken, came from Jensen, one of their three central midfielders. They had... Um, Janlet, Nordgaard and Jensen playing in midfield and I'm really impressed by all three. I thought they combined together really, really well and I thought, if anything, they dominated their midfield. They really, really hurt us in midfield, especially with Casemiro playing the way he's playing at the moment. The Casemiro thing, I'm not really too sure what's going on. I don't know if this is just now his level because there's been this common assertion out there that clubs like Real Madrid don't sell players who are at their peak. 
they re- very rarely let go of players who are not top, top, top draw. So most likely Real Madrid noticed that he was already on the wane and they were open to letting him go. And of course, United came in with an offer that was stupid. They offered him obviously stupid wages and he'd be dumb not to come to get one last big payday before he probably heads up um, back to Brazil or something before his retirement. So maybe people are saying that his legs are already gone and it's a level that we're going to get. I just personally think that United is a bit of a toxic and dark club and it's no coincidence that whenever we buy good players, even if they start pretty decently, by the second season, they usually acquiesce to our current level. Um, We saw it with Bruno Fernandes, we've seen it with many other players before that, where they come in, they start on fire and then they slowly but surely revert back to form and how the club and the players basically play. So I don't think that's the case, but I also think the introduction of Amrabat um, has been a godsend. Our transfer window was absolutely shocking. But one thing I was really hoping for was that we'd get cover for Casemiro because we saw how important Casemiro was for us, especially towards the end of last season, um, playing in that kind of defensive midfielder, um, kind of protecting the back four and also offering an option on set pieces and just, you know, having the odd goal contribution here and there important role for our team in the way that we play so the fact that we got Amrabat in for me was a big thing and I was happy that he was being able to play I think what we've seen so far obviously Casemiro wasn't playing at his best but the Amrabat and Casemiro as two deep lining playmakers or midfielders doesn't work I don't think their combination was great I think when Ericsson came on he naturally goes a little bit more forward and wanders around so it basically left Amrabat on his own at the back and I think he played a lot better being the main number six quote-unquote playing just be just in front of the defenders and it obviously helped that he was playing in front of Maguire and Evans who weren't the most mobile um, maybe Maguire isn't the best at his feet so he was always the outlet always in space and he had a lot of involvement and he kind of I think dictated and controlled the midfield pretty well in the second half so happy to see Emma back there um, overall we didn't play well in the first half they scored a goal um, I think the goal was very concerning for Onana um, I don't think that strike from Jensen was enough to trouble a goalkeeper of his level should be able to save that that should be your that should be your fucking tea and cake that should be simple for you to save and the thing that I'm having an issue with when it comes to Onana is this we bought him specifically for his ball playing ability as a goalkeeper who can play out from the back, who can spray balls over the top, who can always receive the ball under pressure, it kind of allows our defence to kind of push up a bit further up the pitch or just the team overall. And obviously it gives us an option to kind of play out from the back directly. Cool, no problem. But the issue with him is that his ball playing ability so far we've seen maybe isn't as good as people made it seem as. It's decent. It's obviously better than fucking De Gea, but it's not so good that it could excuse the mistakes that he's making as a goalkeeper. These unforced errors, these mistakes in concentration, I don't know what it is, are really concerning because that shot from Jensen, if I remember correctly, I haven't watched the game back, but I watched it live at the time. If I'm not mistaken, it took either one or two deflections coming through and it was quite central. And the way that he dived, I think I described it in the space I was in, he sort of dived like when you're not a goalkeeper and you try going goal and you dive, usually you have a tendency of trying to like dive towards your feet. You don't kind of dive outwards. It's kind of an unnatural position to put yourself in. You have to do that over a number of training to kind of get into the habit of like stretching your body to kind of stop the ball. And he didn't do that. He saw like dive towards his feet like he was an amateur. Um, and if anything, he kind of reminded me of like KSI in one of those charity matches, the way he kind of dived. It was really strange. So that was really odd. And then when he dived and went to touch the ball, he sort of tried to scoop it which is an odd thing also. Instead of trying to just hold his hand out and have a strong wrist, which a lot of keepers do nowadays when the shot is low, you basically hold out a really strong wrist to take and take out the power of the ball and then you kind of gap it with the second touch. You try to kind of scoop it out of the goal and obviously that didn't work. He scooped the top of the ball, the ball trickled in and of course another big mistake. Even though people could say the screening in front of him wasn't the best, maybe should someone should have blocked it. I think Evans or somebody turned their back to the ball, whatever. I just don't think that shot should be enough to trouble a keeper of his level. Level, which is really concerning because it's not only that he's making cons- you know mistakes in big high pressure games he's also making mistakes in games that we should be winning like Brentford at home do you know what I mean that's the real mis- that's the real uh, worry for me and it's looking like most likely we made a mistake and the issue is not that we made a mistake as clubs do in terms of signing on honor I think we waited so long to replace David De Gea we left it so to the last minute 
when we got another goalkeeper in, we didn't have an option of like basically phasing him in, of having an opportunity to phase out the Gea and having an opportunity to play or not at the same time, or maybe flipping between the two. And then when the summer comes around, you let go of the Gea like normal teams do. Instead, we had to kind of do it all really bluntly, right at the end, figure it out on the go. And now I think the management or the team should realise that you know, Onana maybe isn't at the level that we need, top, top level, to kind of take us where we need to take to. But whatever. Um, I think after that, we defended pretty decently. Second half was pretty okay. I thought the substitution of Casemiro for Ayerson was an interesting one, even though I personally would have taken off Bruno because I feel like he didn't really do anything um, of any particularities in the game. He was very quiet, very ineffective. Um, Rashford probably played pretty decently. He might be a bit unlucky to get subbed up, but I thought towards the end of the, you know, towards the 60th minute mark when he did, I think when he did get subbed, he was starting to look like he was tired and running out of ideas. And as per usual, I think the issue I have with myself when it comes to the substitutions with this team is just that I personally think having played a little bit of Sunday football, a little bit of Saturday football, I just know what managers what what happens to a dressing room when managers refuse to like rotate players because they are quote quote the best ones it's not good for the morale of the team it really isn't you need to have this you know there needs to be a way of there needs to, there needs to be like a, a culture in the dressing room or in the team where everybody's place is up for grabs nobody's place is guaranteed of course unless you're the top top level player like a Messi or Ronaldo and stuff fair enough but for the most part everyone's place should be up for grabs and then you kind of you know it, it, what it de- leads to is then a very competitive team who's always trying to play for positions on the training days and then when it comes to the matches it leads to really high performing teams because you know if you don't play well someone else might come and replace you take the shine away from you and then start the next game and then you won't get a sniff again but for some reason at United, we have this culture, especially some of our fans online, whenever you suggest, oh, Bruno should get subbed, um, Bruno should get dropped, Marshall, Marshall should get dropped, the immediate reply is, oh, but for who? As if to say, the options on the bench aren't an option. It's like, why do you have them on the bench then? Why do you have players on the bench if they're not options? Just to like, just, just to make sure that the, the, the game goes ahead. I don't think that's the case. Even if the players on the bench isn't technically as good as the ones on the pitch, they should be allowed to play so that it could remind the players who are on the pitch not to take their place for granted. And I think for me personally, having played a bit of the football, played a bit of the game, um, I just feel like Rashford and Bruno take their places for granted. They know they're always going to play. And I don't think that helps for the squad harmony. And that also might be in part why, you know, Eric Ten Hag and Jaden Sancho are having this fucking standoff. Um, that's happening but anyway that is something for another time the game itself attack wise I thought we were pretty blunt nothing it kind of ineffective I thought the game changed for the better when um, Anthony and Garnacho come on even though Gar- Anthony wasn't great I thought because they're both at least have the intention of going forward it kind of changes the way our team moves and attacks and how the opposing team sort of deals with us I thought as soon as Garnacho and Anthony came on unfortunately for Brentford they dropped about 10 5 to 10 yards deep it invited us it kind of gave us more space to run into it put more pressure on them but then the final substitution of McTominay was the one that really surprised me because I was like spitting at the fucking I was like going crazy at the screen when I was watching the stream like oh my god why did you bring McTominay on to try to win the game and McTominay does what good players should do and shuts me the fuck up by scoring two goals in extra time of normal play bro two fucking goals and the winner was absolutely madness to see the scenes and he came on like a man on fire he came on with like a man possessed and i think he said in the post match interview that he was watching the fucking david beckham documentary on netflix and that kind of inspired him and reminded him of how great a club united was which is right because people forget we were actually an amazing club at one time now we've been flipping, you know, dragged into the doldrums and we're fucking pathetic as a football club, mainly because of the Glazers and inept management and shitty transfer policy and really entitled, egotistical, fucking pre- like crazy, deluded fucking players. But we were once a very great team. So he was reminded of that legacy when he watched the Dave Beckham documentary and he came on with a point to prove, like, this is Man United, right? I mean, in like kind of, this is Sparta mode. And first, to me, I think that first goal, that first goal was really good because, you know, I was watching on stream. I kind of turned my head back quickly as it was about to go in. And I honestly thought that was Hoyland. I didn't know that was McTominay because the way he sp- the way he kind of spun, controlled the ball on his, on his leg, on his knee, sorry. 
you know, one without even I don't think he even dropped, I don't think he even bounced one touch and bang volley into the bottom corner. That was a superb finish. And then the second goal with the header um just over the keeper's hand was really good as well for the winner. Like he was on fire, bro. He scored two goals within like what two or three minutes and shit and obviously helped us to win the game. So I was over the moon, jubilant, you know, fucking jub very, very jubilant. I think some fans weren't that happy because they were hoping he would lose so Ayrton could get fired. I just don't think the club is ever going to fire him so quickly into the season. It's not going to happen. Again, I just think with the looming sale above their heads, it doesn't really make much sense for them to try to go out there and find a new manager. So it's not going to happen. So we'll sack him. We'll have fucking Steve McLaren be the coach for a time. It'll just be super annoying. I'd rather just let the club bleed as it is. We're not going to win anything anyway this season. It is a bit of a fucking gimme. Um, you know, we're not playing for anything, in my personal opinion, apart from maybe some domestic trophies. So just let him kind of do what he does. And then when the new ownership comes in, if the team is still not performing, he'll probably get fired anyway. Do you know what I mean? It's no rush. Um, so it's kind of on him to perform well and it's on the players to also perform well because when this new ownership comes in, you would assume they'll want to start from a somewhat clean slate. You would assume so. But again, who knows when it comes to these managements and these teams and shit. But overall, very enjoyable game. Very happy with the win. Um, the performance, again, wasn't the greatest. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of question marks around the team and the, our formation. I think one of the big question marks for me is Ericton Hogg's decision-making ability. Because a lot of fans online, myself included, fucking idiots that know nothing about the game who just kind of talk about stuff online and stuff we were saying from the onset why is Amrabat having to play left back I understand we don't have any current left backs at the moment that can play in that position but surely if you spent all that time and effort and money to get Amrabat in lastminute.com you know how important he is to play in midfield why wouldn't you just play another centre back at left back it's a makeshift stopgap option it's not ideal but just playing an actual defender at that position should be a better option than playing a world-class, I think, defensive midfielder in that position. It makes no sense. And finally, Ericsson Haag did it, tried it, played Lindelof at left-back, which was helpful because Lindelof is also a left foot centre-back. That kind of helps. But it doesn't really matter. I guess you could still play them as a free and have Dallow be out, you know, kind of advancing as a really attacking full-back on, on a wide here, whatever it may be. And then, of course, of course, he can tuck in and make a little screen with the midfielders and make it like a free free two or free free one sorry. But as soon as we played with Amrabat in midfield and had Lindelof at left back, it gave the overall team a lot more balance because I've said before, like people underestimate how difficult it is to play left back. Left back is a really, really hard position to get because the balls are coming across here. They're coming from behind. They're coming over the top, um, especially if you're in your natural positions. You've got a lot of blind spots that you have. There's a lot to defend, a lot to kind of look after when it comes to defensive dis discipline um, and positional awareness playing at left back. So having a midfielder there is just... A it doesn't make any sense I'd much rather have a centre back play there just to fill in the gaps and I think that balance worked a lot better personally and of course with these three you have you know Lindelof Evans and Amrabat you also have three pretty decent ball playing players in the first place so why not have all these three next to each other and then they can allow them to kind of spring the ball forward to Mount and Rashford and whatnot so um, again um, good decision finally that he made um, I thought the Ericsson substitution at halftime was also a welcome change because he does wait too long to do it but I thought the changes and how animated Eric Ten Hag was on the bench like legitimately I've never seen Eric Ten Hag that animated on the sidelines any before I think that was proof enough for me that he was really nervous I think this game was win it by any means necessary we won I'm happy about it but definitely it was squeaky bum time for fucking Eric Ten Hag he was feeling the fucking pressure so I'm glad that he got the pressure off him hopefully now he's realized the error of his ways Hopefully now we have a team and a selection process that isn't just based on GA and what you did for me lately because I feel like Bruno Fernandes and Rashford don't deserve to play based on current form. But again, people will tell me, who, 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 play whoever's on the bench. It doesn't fucking matter, but he won't because he wants to do that. And if effectively, if he keeps doing that and keeps putting his faith in, in fucking Marcos Rashford and Bruno Fernandes, most likely those two players will get him sacked. That's the issue. I know they saved, him, they saved us and they saved his job last season. But the way they're playing now, if they continue playing the way they are and if we continue being inconsistent as we are, they will most likely lead to him getting fired. And I just hope that doesn't happen because if it happens, it'll stir all the attention away from the owners who are the real cancerous problem in this club. That's what we need to get out ASAP. That's what you'd want. But again, what do I know? Then the other interesting thing about this is the fucking Premier League, sorry, the Premier League table. 
I just realised we're only six points behind City, who just lost against Arsenal today. I watched the game actually, very entertaining match. Arsenal probably deserved the victory on the balance of play, I think, slightly towards the end there. Very good goal, kind of route one-ish. I think it was Partey from the back, long ball, out to Tomiyasu. He heads it down, Havertz controls it, lays it back to uh, Martinelli who hits it and it hits Ake and deflects into the goal. So a pretty basic one, you know, long ball type of goal, but really well, what really well worked. And they end up obviously beating Man City for the first time in a very, very long time. And Man City are third now. Arsenal second, Tottenham first. Um, you've got Tottenham and Arsenal both on 20 and Man City on 18. But United are in 10th. And we've only got 12 points, even though it's one of our worst starts ever. We're on 12 points, only six points behind City. And... We are facing Sheffield United away from home next. And then we've got the Manchester Derby the following weekend after that, after the Champions League game as well. So we have an opportunity if we need, if possible, to actually close the gap between some of the top teams, which is weird considering how horribly we've we've started. And the fact that we've already lost um, so many games already, that we are in a position where we can get kind of close to the top teams. The Premier League is a weird place. But again, that obviously assumes that they also keep losing, which isn't going to happen most likely. Um, all these teams have blips. They have a lot of players out and shit. But it's crazy to think that United are only 10th for 12 points and City are only third with 18 points, even though we've had one of our worst seasons on paper. We're not that far away from clubs that, you know, clubs that Man City are going forward. So maybe there's a chance for us. Maybe there's a chance for us.